Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum and good morning everyone. In our today's session, we will be focusing on proximal lesions of the posterior teeth and we shall learn how to perform aesthetic restorations in these clinical manifestations of carious lesions using dental composites. Uh, despite significant improvements in composite systems and adhesive systems since their introduction, posterior restorations still require a careful placement technique in order to avoid uh, microleakage, post-operative sensitivity, or less than ideal anatomy. Marginal adaptation and microleakage prevention is most critical at the gingival margin which is determined by the extent of lesion itself. The formation of an adequate contact during the insertion of class two resin composite uh, can be particularly challenging as the lesion extends more gingivally. In more superficial lesions such as this one, uh, it's comparatively easier to manage because of its relationship with the interdental tissues. Size of the lesion is directly related to the prognosis as um, matrix adaptation is easier which can securely engage and provide optimum seal at the gingival floor. As the lesion size increased and as it extends more gingivally, the more challenging the situation is. As the preparation is enlarged, Resistance form as well as bonding variables must be kept in mind during preparation, matricing, and restoration. Because uh, whenever there is some kind of root involvement, there will be some bonding issues because of uh, less mineral content. Maybe we are trying to bond on a cementum and the root dentine already has very less mineral content and higher collagen content so that's why there will be some bonding issues uh, next will there will be some isolation problems because whenever there is a class 2 lesion depending on the size there are some inflamed papilla interdentally and these inflamed papilla uh, produce exudate the inflammatory exudate which can interfere with the etched or uh, newly prepared surface. Another variable is the depth of light penetration in these regions. If uh, the depth is greater, there will be lesser chances of a proper light penetration and hence there will be less degree of conversion. And because of less degree of conversion, there could be some uh, problems with the bonding or there could be some uncured composite there are chances of secondary lesion as well as post-treatment hygiene maintenance problems because uh, there are chances of overhanging in this region as well. To build up the proximal wall and the insertion of class 2 composite restoration requires proper matricing for a good contact formation. Hence, correct use of enamel and dentine etching bonding steps and incremental placement of the resin composites and careful finishing is extremely important. Anatomically correct and tight contacts are difficult to achieve with resin restorations because resin composite materials are not condensable like amalgam. Uh, the use of amalgam matrix bands like flat matrices uh, for composite restorations generally leads to a straight point contact that are located in the occlusal third of uh, the tooth which leads to under contouring of the situation as you can see in this illustration if i'm using a flat matrix it is it is not going to create a contoured proximal contact so hence we are getting a flat contact which is not ideal uh, remaining under contoured restoration will lead to over stimulation of the tissues uh, the matrix systems for composite materials are designed to create curved proximal surfaces and tight contact areas. Uh, these are generally comprised of thin contoured matrix bands and a tooth separator. You can see that it is creating optimum contours in the proximal contact area. So after restoration, uh, it is producing an anatomical contact 
which is an ideal contact. Talking about the indi indications, uh, these are almost the same indications when I were doing a composite restoration in the posterior region. Uh, again, small and moderate restorations, uh, preferably within enamel margin, is uh, advised. Most premolars and molar restorations, particularly when the aesthetics is in high demand. A restoration that does not provide all the occlusal contacts uh, is generally weaker. Uh, and uh, a restoration that does not have uh, a higher occlusal contact or the pa patient is uh, not suffering from any parafunctional habits. A restoration that can appropriately isolate during the procedure. If you cannot perform adequate isolation, there is a very bad prognosis of these kind of restorations. Uh, some restorations that may serve as foundations for crowns and some very large restorations that are used to strengthen the remaining or weakened tooth structure. When the operating site cannot be appropriately isolated, I told you that uh, these are among the contraindications because if you will do the restoration, there will be minimal um, uh, curing in the gingival region. There are chances of bone failure in that region. So it's always contraindicated that you use some other material such as you can try um, a sandwich technique by using resin modified in these areas prior to use uh, any composite. Uh, whenever there are some high occlusal forces because of parafunctional habits, um, uh, this is among the contraindications. Uh, patients who are having high carry susceptibility and the patients who are with poor oral hygiene the composites are contraindicated in these situations so again whenever we are talking about the advantages uh, aesthetics is the number one advantage followed by um, we are not uh, removing a lot of tooth structure as we are trying to do in amalgam which requires uh, a strict geometry in order to get ideal retention and resistance form and with composites, it is a easier and less complex tooth preparation. And since we are using bonding system, uh, it is providing insulation. And the composite itself is an insulating material. Uh, there is a decreased chance of microleakage because of use of bonding adhesive system. And we are also reinforcing remaining tooth structure by using composite and adhesive dentistry. Among the disadvantages, if not used carefully, uh, there will be some polymerization shrinkage effects, uh, some po post-op sensitivity or debonding if uh, uh, you have not followed all the recommendations during uh, the preparation and uh, etching and bonding uh, process. Uh, with some materials, there is a low fracture toughness and uh, it is quite a technique sensitive and time consuming as compared to amalgam. And uh, it is also uh, expensive than amalgam. Uh, so these are among the disadvantages. So uh, the problems with composites for use in class two restoration is number one, uh, it's difficult to, it's not impossible, but it is difficult to achieve moisture control. But if you are using rubber dam, you don't have to worry about that. And in deep subgingival extension areas, uh, adaptation of uh, the matrix band and deep margin elevation, and these are all difficult procedures to attempt for. So next we'll discuss the clinical techniques for class two composite restorations. As you know, the shade of the tooth is the most important parameter when aesthetics is the paramount. The shade of the tooth should be determined before the teeth are subjected to any prolonged drying because dehydrated teeth become lighter in shade as a result of decrease in translucency. Minor or no tooth preparation, it may be necessary to clean the operating site with a slurry of pumice to remove the plaque pellicle and superficial stains along with the calculus deposits if there are. Knowing the pre-op occlusal relationship is paramount for optimum restoration. So we shall mark the occlusal marks before any restorations. 
local anesthesia should be provided to make more pleasant and uninterrupted procedure <clears throat> it also resulted in marked reduction in salivation isolation is extremely important for a successful composite respiration although with cotton rolls and other means of indirect isolation a composite respiration can be performed but it's highly unpredictable in this pictorial <clears throat> you guys can see uh, there is a uh, wedge application in the teeth each mat matrix band should be secured with a wedge a wedge is needed to maintain adaptation of the matrix to the tooth and the gingival margin to avoid the overhangs and prevent adjacent tooth from getting nicked with high speed hand piece excessive wedging forces are unnecessary when an additional tooth separator such as rings will be used so insert wedge where the embrasure is wide from buccal to lingual or from lingual to buccal coming towards the benefits of the wedging or the pre wedging will cause slight separation interdentally it depresses the interdental papillae it controls hemorrhage prevent oozing of cavicular fluid it seals the matrix gingivally and it also ensures the tight contacts think before drill so we'll coming towards the tooth preparation uh, wedging of the proximal contacts to prevent the adjacent tooth and to prevent the overhangs in the restorations creating access to the faulty structure with your high speed hand piece removal of the faulty structure convenience from for the restoration and then the retention is obtained by the bonding tooth preparation <clears throat> for class 2 has decreased pulpal depth of axial walls which allows greater conservation of tooth structure occlusal and proximal wall converge occlusally and provide additional retention from from the vertical movements proximal box preparation has a cavo surface angle at right angle to the enamel surface facially or lingually bevels are given on the occlusal surface and that are optimal due to the that are optional due to the direction of enamel rods whereas proximal surface beveling must be done prudently gingival floors should clear the contact apically and they should be bud joined after the tooth cavity preparation the matrix system is selected based on the operator preference the cavity location and the size if the contact is not open during the tooth preparation then conventional matrix materials may be simpler to use rather than the curved matrix bands and the separating rings if you are using a tofelmire retainer then always pre burnish your band using a ball ended burnisher to create a slight contour at the contact point otherwise it will create a flat contact which is under contoured again and not, not ideal in larger cavities a circumferential band can be chosen over a sectional bands ultra thin curved or self retaining circumferential bands enhance the ability to form tight curved contact areas and should be used rather than the traditional circumferential amalgam matrix bands in a tofel my retainer if the tooth is in an irregular position and embrasure shapes can sometime prevent seating of the ring it is useful for a dentist to have a variety of separating rings with different tine shapes with round or rectangular cross sections for a better fit in some buccal or lingual embrasures when a matrix system and a separating ring is used the matrix position should be verified prior to the application of the morning agent and resin composite material a properly matrix tooth should no gap shows no gap along the gingival margin between the tooth and the matrix band the problems with the matrix use always pre contoured matrix to form a proper contact point if you use a uh, a straight matrix it will also make a flat surface and it will retain it like under contoured restoration 
your matrix should be passively and shouldn't deformed. If the matrix is deformed, again the restoration will be deformed because you're going to pack in the restoration when it's been matrized. Always remember your matrix retainer tines should be inserted below matrix and the wedge to hold the tooth uh, from the transitional line angles or the spots. Let's discuss some uh, clinical aspects of class 2 uh, restorations. Class 2 is a challenge. Why it is a challenge? The reason being is uh, what I feel in my whole clinical practice that to find an actual tooth is a problem. Patient complains that food is trapped but most of the times when you examine that situation clinically the ridge remains intact. So to find a real culprit is a problem for the dentist. For that you have to evaluate class 2 cavity in five different aspects. But before examination, you have to ask the patients to have some scaling in the polishing. As you know that poor oral hygiene is a leading cause of the class 2 cavity. So with lot of calculus and the plaque, you cannot examine. You can miss some details during examination. So after scaling in the polishing, what five factors you have to evaluate? See any redness and inflammation around that area that indicates there is some food trap areas there so it leads to inflammation of the gums see any roughness of the tooth surface that is only possible if you dry the tooth and the surrounding tissues do floss to evaluate the contact points then the next thing is evaluate if there is any discolorations like in that picture there is a visible discolorations on the mesial aspect of the molar but the ridge is 100 is perfectly fine so you have to evaluate all these things. In the final, you have to go with the bite wing radiograph. That is the recommended radiograph for the class 2 inspection. So as I told you that in previous slide, uh, there is a black discoloration on the occlusal aspect. So when you open the cavity, there is a visible carious lesions. So you need magnifications and you need proper evaluations with drying of the soft tissues and the dental heart structures. What is an ideal contact? As we know that in posterior teeth, the contact is on the buccal sides and at the junction of the occlusal and the middle third. But here, the contact between two premolars is good and but the contact between premolar and the molar is full of defects. The ridge is intact but there is a lingual carious lesions. For that, because that area was just filled with some plaque. So when you ask the patients go for scaling and the polishing, then that area visible to you. So you have to follow the protocols. Like that one, that's a very clear picture. There's an open contact and the food trap is visible there. When there is food lodgement, there's demineralizations and that demineralizations leads to demineralization of the dentine and then enamel gets unsported and then fracture with mastications which is recommended burr for class 2 cavity preparations. That's a round burr, round diamond and round carbide. But remember that when you prepare the occlusal surface, always use a small round burr with a high speed handpiece. But when you go deep, close to the pulp, when there's a chance of pulp exposure, always use a small round but in, in slow speed handpiece with air water spray. And if you feel that the tails are compromised, you cannot evaluate a deep part of the cavity, stop the water coolant, use only air coolant. So that the main purpose is just to cool the dentine and uh, avoid overheating of the dentine. What is the best way to isolate in a class 2 cavity? The picture that's visible here, it's an cavity. It's occlusal cavity. For that, you can isolate a single tooth. But for the class 2, you have to isol isolate multiple teeth so that you can work freely because if you isolate a single tooth, you cannot uh, make a cavity uh, in proximal sides and you can adapt the matrix. So best way is to have multiple teeth isolations and the clamp that is good for the restorative dentistry is wingless clamp because it's small in size and it gives you a space for better performance of your dental work. As you see that when there's a one wall missing, it's an ideal cavity. It's easier to restore because you have the neighboring 
premolar is there that guides you about the height of the marginal ridge and helps you in the adaptation of the matrix in a better way. So it's the easiest one, but they, these are very uh, rare in clinical practice because when there is a class 2 cavity on one side, possibility there is a cavity on the other side as well. Like that one, when two teeth need to be filled, uh, it means that two uh, different teeth, different walls are involved. So you can pass the matrix at the same time and with the wedge at the same time and build them at the same time. No problem in that. But here is a challenge, here is a problem because two adjacent walls are missing. You don't have any guidance from height of the marginal reach. So here is a problem. Here you have to build one wall at one time. So the wall that you have restored, it guides you in building up of the second wall. And here you have to pass the two matrix at the same time but build one wall at a time, remove the matrix and then shift your retainer to the next wall. So it gives you a tight contact. But if you try to build both walls at the same time, what would happen? There might be a space in between the two, two teeth that leads to poor contact and then there is the same complaint of the patient again and again to the full lodgement. So try to understand you have to build one wall at a time when you, when you have a cavity in the adjacent teeth. The most important thing in class 2 is to close the cervical contact. That's the most important thing because when the contact is open, there is a problem with inflammation, secondary caries and then there is a contact is open, it leads to uh, marginal leakage as well. So to close the cervical contact, you need a tight wedge, tight wedge and it, must, it should be a wooden wedge. It should not be a plastic wedge because it can slip away. And if you don't get a tight cervical contact, you can use a bigger wedge or tie a Teflon tape on the wedge to make the contact tight. A lot of colleagues ask me, can we build the proximal wall with the flowable composite? The answer is no. The reason being is, flowable is a very soft material. It has poor strength, so it can fracture. You need a packable composite here in building of the proximal wall. Because packable has more filler content, it is stronger as compared to the flowable ones. So let's see a clinical case of class 2 composite restorations. A 30 year old female patient presented to me with history of food trap between upper first molar and second premolar. The tooth are almost covered with calculus. So before any examination, I advise the patient to go for scaling. As we know that patient most of the times they argue that they are only visiting you for the restorations and they don't need any scaling. But to evaluate a lesion in an area with a lot of calculus difficult for the dentist. So please always ask. So after examination, the next step is to prepare the cavity. For cavity preparation, the most important thing is you have to pass the interproximal wedge because interproximal wedge helps you in protection of the soft tissues and also prevents the drilling of the adjacent tooth. And remember that the wedge, the good wedge is wooden and it should be triangular and you have to pass the wedge from the buccal side to the lingual side depending on the space available in the embrasure area. So next thing is you have to open up the cavity. I asked you already that you, you can use round diamond burr on the occlusal surface uh, with a high speed handpiece. When you go down, use a round diamond but in slow speed handpiece and try to use air and water coolants. But if your details are compromised, you can use an air coolant as well. Here you can see that cavity is still dirty, there is a lot of demineralizations and you cannot bond the composite in that cavity. The reason being is the collagen is denatured and uh, there is a demineralization. So the composite cannot bond perfectly. So you have to remove all of the caries. The next thing is uh, I pass the rubber dam. Why I, not, why, not, why I not use a rubber dam in my previous slides? The reason being is uh, the contact was quite irregular. So when you try to pass the rubber dam in irregular contacts, rubber dam sheets can be tear off. So better to prepare the cavity, open up the proximal context and then pass the rubber dam. So here the cavity is still dirty and uh, there is a lot of uh, soft caries there. We have to remove it. We, have, we don't have to leave any caries there because that caries is a weak part of the tooth. That can lead to debonding of the composites. So here you can see the cavity is very clean. There is no demineralization left there. 
is no dark caries, enamel is sound, dentin is sound. That's an ideal cavity to restore with the composites. And always remember that the contact should be open between premolar and the molar for the passive placement of the matrix. Because the wall of the, the shape of the wall of the proximal site is always dependent on the shape of the matrix. But when the matrix is deformed, then the shape would be deformed. So you have to place a passive matrix and the shape of the matrix should be preserved. So next we just pass the two matrix simultaneously and interproximal wedge in between and we will build one wall at one time and uh, as you see in the picture the tines of the matrix retainer should be in between the matrix and the wedge. So we will fill one wall and then we will remove the matrix from that wall and shift the matrix retainer to the next next tooth. So here uh, one wall is constructed. No, the matrix tines have been shifted to the molar. And always remember that uh, you cannot build the two walls simultaneously. The reason being is I told you already that the thickness of the matrix can lead to the gap in between the two, two molars. So one wall at one time and remove the matrix and shift the tines to the next one. So here uh, the class 2 has been converted into class 1. So now we have to restore the central part now. So the base of the cavity should be filled with the flowable uh, around about 1 mm increments and then remaining part of the box should be filled with 2 mm increments of the packable, packable composites. And we just did the occlusal part uh, cusp by cusp. So the occlusion of the patient is a, is a priority for a dentist. It should be preserved. Occlusal part should not end into a flat restoration that can create a problem in mastication. So here is a post-op situation, uh, the very well adapted composites, the contacts are the tight and there is no uh, carious lesions visible. So that's an ideal contact that helps the patient in the mastications and then there would be no uh, food trap in between the molars. So that's a so after doing uh, clinical work, uh, the next thing is to evaluate your work with some radiograph. That radiograph helps you to evaluate your proximal contacts and cervical part of the restoration. That remains open in most of clinical situations when you don't adapt the matrix well. So that radiograph helps you to evaluate the performance of your uh, restorations. So guys, uh, at the end of the lecture, I want to uh, recommend you a few things. And bite wing is a recommended radiograph for class 2. You cannot take a periapical radiograph to evaluate the carious lesions. As we know that periapical is only good for periapical area. It don't tell you details about the carious lesions and the extent of the restorations. So bite wing is a recommended one. And the second thing is use a round diamond and round carbide for the cavity preparations. I told you already that when you try to open the occlusal cavity, uh, in the occlusal surface, you use a round diamond in a high speed handpiece. But when you go near to the pulp, always work in a very precise way. Need a round diamond but in slow speed handpiece. And always drill the cavity in a brushing actions. Don't drill, drill, drill. Okay. And then important thing is that you always prepare a cavity with air and water spray. But if you cannot visualize the details, so you can just close the water coolants and just work with the air coolant. So next thing is don't prepare cavity with a wedge. That's very important thing because interproximal wedge not only protects your soft tissues, but also protects the neighboring tooth during cavity preparations. Because most of time what happens when you don't use a wedge, you can drill the adjacent uh, well adapted tooth that once, once there is a drilling, so there is a process of demineralization starts so you have to avoid this thing and the wedge should be wooden it should be triangular it should be tight enough but if the wedge is not tight you can wrap wrap up the wedge with some teflon tape then the most important thing is always use a pre-contoured matrix for class 2 restorations because shape of the matrix resembles the shape of the proximal wall don't use a toffel mire because always ends in a flat restorations and the finally, guys, nothing is a challenge until you work, work, work. And you have to work for the rest of your life.
थैंक यू गाइस